for our listener, a little little uh, disclaimer. We recorded this with Markel uh, last week, the day before he had his <clears throat> his uh, his knee injury. Uh, we've since uh, spoken with Markel and, and wished him well. Um, we had some thoughts about whether or not even to release this audio, but I, I, I think we wanted to because it really shows just what an incredible incredible person he is, an incredible kid he is, and he's going to bounce back from this. I have no doubt. His mental toughness is, is off the charts. For sure. And I think that you guys will see this when you listen. You know, he is in such a good place mentally, and he still is. Uh, and he's already been through so much physically at such a young age that this is just a, it's a small bump in the road for him. Um, and, you know, we're really excited, you know, when he gets back out there, he's going to keep up the pace that he was at before this happened this year, which is, you know, being a really uh, good young player in the league. All right, let's welcome in our guest, Markel Fultz. Markel, what's up, man? How are you? How are you doing, man? It's an honor to be here. I'm glad that you, you know, have me on the show. I've, we've talked about doing this for like the last year, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad this, this finally worked out. Um, before we, we started recording, we were just talking about um, some of the logistics of this season and the, t- the, the POC testing that we have to do in the morning. Um, I don't know how your guys' setup is, but basically, it, let's say shoot arounds at 10 before we can actually go in the building and do treatment, get in the hot tub, uh, shoot, lift, whatever. Uh, we have to get a POC test along with our PCR test, and we have to then go back in our car <laughs> for 30 minutes. Yeah. And I don't know about how what happened with your team, but I know with our team, we would have two to three inconclusive t- POC tests every day for the first like week or so we did it. And so you'd end up having, they'd end up having to run it twice. So then it was like an hour that you'd have to sit in your car. So try getting all your stuff done before practice is like, it's impossible. I don't know what, what has your experience been this season just with the logistics day to day in, in terms of testing? Uh, it, it, it's been exactly the same. Luckily I haven't had any, you know, where I have to do it again, you know, twice, but it's been Tough, you know, because you, you, you want to come in early, as you know, you want to come in early and maybe get some treatment or some extra shots up. And you got to think about that, you know, second guess it because, you know, like you said, you might have to be 10, you know, you're testing at nine o'clock, having to wait, you know, 30 to 45 minutes in your car. Um, it's like you're thinking about it. <laughs> you're thinking about it because you might have to come in early. If you want to come in early, that's eight o'clock, you know, to sit in your car for 30, 40 minutes. Don't let, let it, you know, mess up and you have to do it again. But um, it's definitely been something even, you know, coming in after traveling, you know, uh, most guys want to get up shots on their off day or something. You know, you got to think about coming in this facility, you know, having to wait in your car, you know, 45 minutes before you, you even step in and just get a massage. Um, so it's been a crazy, crazy experience, but it's, it's taught me patience and, um, you know, how to <laughs> find other things to do, you know, in my spare time. So. Yeah, it's uh the logistics on the road are interesting to me because they're different. So like in the home market, I think I've figured it out. Like I know what time I have to get up. I know what time I have to leave my apartment. I know now I'm I know where to get my coffee. And then, you know, I, I kind of get tested and then I drink my coffee while I wait. So I, I've kind of like figured that out. But on the road, every city sort of has been different because some cities we've done shoot around. So like I'll give you an example in Oklahoma City. Uh, I wanted to go get shots up. We weren't doing shoot around in the morning and we had an 11 a.m. Uh, uh, walkthrough, but they told me that because of when the testing was at like 930, they wouldn't have the POC results back in time for me to actually go shoot at 10 a.m. So I couldn't shoot on game day. So I don't I don't know if you've developed the routine yet. I know we've, we ta- we used to talk about this in Philly all the time in terms of developing a routine, but yeah. that to me has been the most frustrating part, I think, is just having your sort of routine flipped. Absolutely. I, I, that's the other thing I was going to say. I, was, I don't know if you guys had like shoot around. We haven't had a shoot around yet, like when we we're on the road. So everything's been like walkthrough. And so you just come down, you know, you go through the same process in, in your hotel. And it's like, you kind of want that process um, at home. But then you realize like, well, you're actually doing the same thing because you're not, you're still not going in the gym. So 
Uh, I do think that's probably the toughest thing, like, as well as trying to find that same rhythm while you're on the road of, you know, if you can go in the gym and get shots up or if you can, you know, just be in the gym, moving around. But uh, it's definitely been an uncertainty, you know, going on the road and not knowing, like, what it's going to be like. Like, you don't even know if you can use your hotel weight room. You know, so it's like it's crazy, really. So it's been like so many rules that, you know, I, I know that you had to adjust to. And not only myself, but my teammates, we're just trying to, like, figure it out as we go. Um, it just it's a crazy. It's so crazy. What's the what's the setup like with like restaurants and stuff like that on the road? Uh, I know for us, like they say that we have like certain restaurants that are, you know, NBA approved. Um but they haven't came out with the list yet, you know, cause it's still early, but, um, it's, it's tough, you know, you don't want to risk getting COVID or anything. So like right now, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can order from anywhere, um, like to deliver, but like we were told, like, we're not even allowed to go to the front desk to ask for, you know, keys or, you know, room service to come to our room. So it's like, it's pretty much you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. Once you get on the road, you better, you know, know how to clean, make up your bed and everything like that. So, it's crazy. The uh, the league has provided basically. Basically, there's restaurants in every city. They've given us like a contact for that restaurant. So obviously, there's cold weather cities. So in New Orleans, there's options to eat outside. But then there's the cold weather cities, and you can't really eat outside right now. So as long as you're in like a private room and it's on whatever list you know they they've provided, then you're good. Like when we were in Oklahoma City after the game, we got stuck because of snow, so we all went to this place, Mahogany's, and sat in a private room. It was fine. Now the food was good, but you know, just the whole experience, uh, the whole experience was fine. I, I, I wanted to congratulate you, by the way. Uh, I know I, I texted you the other day, but congratulations on your contract. I really um, appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. It's, um, I'm happy for you and, and we're going to get into some of the stuff that you've had to go through, you know, in, in, in your short career. Um, but I want to talk specifically just about Orlando, and it's it's, it's it'd be wrong of me to say you got a second chance because you never really got a first chance. I think it was more like it was a new beginning. I would say is the best way to describe it. I think and, and why that has been uh, such a such a good fit for you because I, I can remember the literally the first time we played against you when you were Orlando. It was like, oh, Markel's happy. Like, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and so it just seems like for you, it it was it was so important to to find that fit. Uh, absolutely, I think that um, like you said, I I wouldn't say uh, second chance because you know the my opportunity was limited um, due to injury and other you know things going on. But um, coming to Orlando is just all open arms. You know, they really pushed me to you know take my time and get healthy and. Um, Again, the, the the position that I was in, you know, to be able to have the ball in my hands, to be able to make mistakes and, you know, have errors and have room to grow was there for me. You know, they were there. They allowed me to make mistakes, uh, although I haven't played that much in, you know, my first two years in the league. So uh, being able to be on that team and have a position, you know, to be in a playoff race was like everything you can ask for and pretty much having my first real year, you know, under me. So um, it was almost like, you know, thinking like I just got drafted again, you know, that's, that was my mindset going into it. And again, like you said, you can just tell like how much happy, how happy I was to be able to be on the floor and just play the game that I love so much. And um, to be able to have, you know, organization who really believed in me and, you know, my teammates pushing behind me after I made a great comeback, you know, to, to get healthy. Um, it was just fun to be out there and competing and then to be able to, you know, actually have uh, a meaning and value to, you know, play for something because we were trying to make it to the playoffs. You know, it was, that just made it that much better, you know, and the rest was history from there, you know, just kept going. Did you feel, did you, you, you talk about playing through mistakes and you, you, you like missed a window your rookie year because you started the year hurt mm -hmm. and then you came back at the end of the year and our team was like formed, you know, we were, we were formed. I know you got to play some during that, that win streak that we went on where we won 16 games in a row. You had a triple double. I think you were the youngest player ever to have a triple double. Mm -hmm. um, but there was that, that window that you sort of missed because you were, you were out at the beginning and then you were out for, for the middle part of the year. Um, and I would imagine like coming back at the, at the, at the end of the season that you're, you're, 
sort of looking over your shoulder and you're worried about making mistakes. Like how, how difficult, specifically that, that end of your rookie year, how difficult was that to kind of jump in that late in the season? Uh, it, was, it was really tough. You know, part of it was uh, just getting back to playing. And um, the other part was, again, the team was doing so well. And, and like you said, we were – I felt like the chemistry was so well in the court. Like, it was like, I don't want to go out there. And, you know, I feel like anything I'm doing is, you know, messing us up. Like, I do something and, like, we might not have a good stint or a good run while I'm in there. I'm like, man, like, damn. Like, everybody was doing so well. But at the same time, it was kind of – I kind of wasn't worried about because of the guys that were on the team, you know, like you having you, you know, uh, Amir, uh, Joel, Ben, you know, just those guys. I felt more comfortable because I knew you guys were accepting me for who I was. But at the same time, you know, in the back of my head, I know, you know, that's what's going on, especially with, you know, knowing how well we were playing. So it was definitely that something that was just constantly, you know, going by the end of the day, you know, I just wanted to root for the team. And I think that's what kept my mind, you know, in the right place, just, you know, wanting the best for the team and wanting us to win. Let, let's go, let's let's go back. Let's go back a little bit because I want to I want to ask you about the pre draft stuff because mm-hmm. I think I think this is kind of a cool story. So you find out that Philly has traded up to the number one pick. I don't know if you got a car or if you got the train, but you went up to Philly basically that day. Yeah, and. And you hooped for him for whatever hour, hour and a half. Can you just can you just tell that story, and Man. and, and kind of how you found out too? Because I, I think yeah. you were you were the consensus sort of number one pick. Everyone thought you were going to Boston, and then it yeah. just sort of changed all at once. Yeah, it was it was actually pretty crazy because um, I actually went to work out. You know, I worked out for Boston, um, who had the number one pick at the time, and then I actually went to work out for the Lakers too, um, who had the second pick at the time. And I think Philly had the third third pick at the time. And so I was working out for those two, pretty much Boston and L.A. And um, I had finished those two workouts, and it was getting closer um, to draft. And I was actually supposed to go to Boston again and work out. They wanted to see me work out again. Um, and so I was – that morning, in my mind, I was thinking, like, okay, I got to go to Boston. Let me get ready. All I could think about is that, you know, everybody – they had the famous run at the end of their workout. So I'm like – all right, I got to do good at this run. <laughs> I got to make sure I got good enough energy. You know, I put in all this work, you know, training, you know, to be able to to do good during my workout. And I'm um, actually get a call from my agent and my mom, and they're talking about how they had discussions for Philly to, you know, trade up to get me. So I was like, oh, man, like, you know, that would be dope. It's right up the street. Um, I'm just like, you know, me, I am just want to hoop. So I'm like, for whoever I got to go work out for, whatever I got to do, I'm trying to do it. You know, I want to be the number one pick. And so they end up saying that, you know, Philly's going to end up going through with that. And, you know, Philly's only about – at this time I'm in Maryland where I grew up, and that's only about three hours, you know, three to four hours away. Um, we actually get on – get in a car. They get a car service, and we shoot straight up to Philly. Um, I do my physical stuff, and I, I literally work out for them for about, like you said, like an hour. I do some drills. Like Joel's there, you know, Cove, um, Ben. And everything goes well in my workout. And uh, we have good talks after and pretty much, you know, I have a good feeling about me going number one. Um, they liked everything they see. And I, I'm really excited going into the draft, you know. And then next couple of days, it, it comes out that they move up for the number one pick. And so I pretty much have like the – I have in the back of my mind, I have a good idea that I'm, you know, going number one. And I'm extremely excited, but I still don't know until I hear my name called. So I'm just like anxious waiting, but, you know feeling really good that I had a chance, you know, to work out for these teams and, you know, Philly believed in me and took that chance, you know, to move up. So it was all history from there. Did, did you have thoughts? We talked to, we've talked to a couple other guys about this. Did you have thoughts before the, like while this process was going on, before the pick was made about like your fit on each of these teams? Like when you're watching them just as like an observer, you're like, Oh, I would like to play here because of X, Y, Z. Um, the craziest thing, like when I used to always get asked about, you know, what team would you like to go on or anything? You know, I never really had like a favorite. I always felt like, you know, who I am as a battle player and as a person, I was versatile and able to fit in, you know, any system. If you wanted me to play off ball, I could do that. If you wanted me to bring the ball up, I feel like I could do that. And so it was really just a matter of like what team I would, I would get on. So I never really had like a favorite team or like any team that I like really wanted to be on. I just wanted an opportunity. And um, 
that's the, that's always been my mindset. You know, I feel like I could help any team. So it was never like, oh, I want to go to, you know, the Lakers. You know, I want to go to – but, you know, I did look at myself in different systems. You know, Boston with IT, you know, a guy that went to Washington. Um, I thought about that. I thought about the Lakers, you know, and of course being in Philly with the, with the big two, you know, it was like, I could be that next piece. So it was definitely, uh, I definitely put myself in that position, but it wasn't no favorite. I would say. This is not, this is not a knock Markel on, on anyone, but like it, it was pretty apparent to me. And I know you were, you were injured, but it was apparent to me pretty early on that like you needed to have the ball in your hands. Um, that you that you were you were more of a dynamic player when the ball was in your hands than playing off the ball, and the and then the the, the Ben piece and Bennett obviously never played point guard in the NBA. He was coming off his rookie season when he was injured, so I think there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of how that would work. But it was apparent fairly early on that maybe that wasn't the best fit. I guess, mm-hmm. although you know at the draft everybody said it was the perfect fit. Um, but then once we started playing, I was like, oh no, Markel needs the ball in his hands and, and Ben also needs the ball in his hands. When did you kind of get the feeling like, oh, maybe, maybe this is not going to be the right fit? Um, I think just as, as, as I started to go on and I, you know, um, started to play and like, you know, we came in to play open gym song and, uh, we started to go through practice and the first couple games. And although I was injured, like you said, I felt like just the ability that the impact that I had when I had the ball in my hands to be able to make plays and the way I moved and, and everything to help everybody else um, in the team was different from when I didn't have the ball in my hands. And um, I, I realized it kind of early, especially with me being limited due to my injury with shooting um, that, you know, it would have been kind of tough for, for both me and, me and Ben to be on the floor at the same time. Um, but I just never, I never let that be an excuse for me to, you know, to stop trying, of course. And I think that's where it kind of came up that, you know, I just had to accept, you know, my opportunity. When if they had me in at the two, I tried to make the best of that. If I had the ball on my hands, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. So I think it was just more so of just trying to find a position or a way for it to work. And um, it just didn't end up happening. So you tried, you tried to play through your injury for a while. Um, yeah. I mean, we could all we could all see that you know you you were struggling with your your, your shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, how hard was that though? Because to 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 shut it down basically, you know, because yeah. you're you're the number one pick. There's these expectations, you know, the 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 process is complete, blah blah blah. Yeah. And I, from from my perspective, you know, I'm I'm watching you as a 19 year old. You know, you see that there is that pressure. That pressure does exist. And I would imagine that it was it was a, a difficult decision at the time to say, no, I need to actually take care of my body here. Man, it was extremely. I think it was probably one of the biggest things I learned now looking back at my career is just taking care of my body. Um, because I, I, I felt stuff early on and I kind of, you know, me being who I was, just the way I, I made it to the NBA, it's just hard work and, you know, fighting through uh, injuries and and. and you know, when I feel bumps and bruises, not really complaining about it, just playing through it. And I think that's the moment I realized, you know, when you feel stuff about your body, you need to speak up. And um, I think that was the toughest thing because, like you said, I, I knew the expectations that were there. I knew um, everything that was going on and me being who I was, I wanted to feel those expectations. I wanted to, you know, be that guy who could help the team, you know, take the next step and, and be that next player. But uh, I, I felt like, I wasn't helping with, you know, my, my injury being in the way and, and, and me not being a hundred percent. So, um, after talking to my agent and, and really talking to my family, it was, it was what was best for me, you know, cause, uh, my body was, you know, more important as you know, you know, you got to take care of yourself. It's a, it's a business at the end of the day. So, um, it was, it was extremely tough to, to stop playing because just my love for the game, you know, you want to be out there, but at the end of the day, it was, it was something that needed to be done. You know, you went, you went, with three, three, four months before you even returned to practice, I yeah. think it was. How? <laughs> I mean, we we talk about um, like rehabbing injuries and how mundane it is, and how <laughs> the day to day grind of that. Like, I it's I hate being hurt because yeah. rehab 
sucks. It's way worse than yeah. It's way worse than being actually <laughs> and, playing. It's like it's and, crazy. And 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 I've told you this before, but like I had some PRP done four or five years ago on my shoulder, mm-hmm. and like I've done these shoulder exercises, not to the level that you had to do. Yeah. But man, there's nothing more fucking annoying <laughs> because it's it's these little tiny exercises over and over, and it, it's it's so it's just so monotonous. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, until you uh, experience, you know, shoulder issues or, you know, any type of injury, really, you don't really uh, appreciate how, like, well your body works and how much, like, little stuff goes into uh, making your body move the way it does. Because, like you said, you know, with with your shoulder, it's just – it's little things. It's little weights. It's little exercises, stretches that you do that you have to do every single day to – build habits that, you know, naturally your arm just does that you don't think about. And it was like the longest days ever. Like, it was just like, man, like, I, I just want to go. Like, I just want to hoop. I want to be able to, you know, you roll your ankle, you just do this, 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 and you're, and you're good. And it's, that probably was the toughest thing. Just like having to grind it out and just listen to your body. Like I learned my body so much, you know, over, these last three years of being injured and, and actually getting back to playing that, you know, um, I'm actually glad that I went through, I went through, I went through, you know, the injury and, and, and the grind of that, because I don't think I would have had an appreciation for my body and, you know, knowing how to advocate for myself and speak up for myself for, you know, things that I'm feeling and, and, and the way that I feel to be able to, you know, have a long career like yourself, you know, I'm trying to be, <laughs> be here for a long time. So, uh, Knowing the, the right things to do for my body and everything like that just makes everything so much smoother. You can experience the epic adventure Wonder Woman 1984 in theaters and on HBO Max, now streaming at no extra cost to HBO Max subscribers. Plus, with HBO Max, stream the greatest collection of series, movies, and exclusive Max originals all in one place. Discover something new to watch, like The Undoing, one of Tommy's favorites, The Flight Attendant, his dark materials, and so much more. Go to hbomax.com or download the app to sign up and start streaming today. Legal disclaimer, Wonder Woman 1984 is rated PG-13. Wonder Woman 1984 available to stream on HBO Max for 31 days from the theatrical premiere. I want to ask about the, the mindset, the emotional and mental toll that that year took on you. Um... There was a, um, I can't remember what what point this was, but there was a there's a video of me uh, after practice uh, cuss, cussing out the Philadelphia media. Um, yeah. I watched this for weeks. Yeah. When you got back from Kentucky, where they would come in as soon as they were allowed in after practice. And they'd all run to a certain spot and they'd all point their iPhones or they'd point their cameras at you. And a lot of times you'd be shooting layups or shooting form shots. It was like the daily, what does Markel's shot look like? Mm -hmm. And the reason I got mad that day was the body language. Like you you were 19 at the time dealing with an injury. And it felt like, and I've said this before, so I'm not knocking the Philly. Yeah. I know they yeah. got to cover it, but it, it, it felt like they were like vultures. Mm-hmm. And they they had lost or ignored some of your humanity. Yeah. And I calmed down and I addressed it with them afterwards, but I did cuss them out. Mm-hmm. Uh, deserve, deservedly so, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> for you, take me through that year from the time that you know, you're, 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 you decide to, to sort of give your body a break and do the rehab process. It's a disappointing start. And now all of a sudden, uh, you know, you've got to deal with this, this noise yeah. from the media. Uh, first, thank you for that. You know, that was like, a another big, big brother moment that you, you know, you stuck, stood up for me and it made me feel even better. Um, but you know, starting from, from all the of the beginning and everything that I was been through, you know, of course, you know, being a professional and being an NBA at the highest level, um, and everybody knows Philly media is like known for, you know, being whatever, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I didn't really 
to me, I didn't, I never got caught up in media, but it definitely was like, like you said, it was like every every day was, you know, what is Markel doing? And and me, I was just, you know, being myself, just I'm just trying to get better. I'm trying to figure my stuff out. Um, but you, at, at, you're, you're you're human. You notice everything. You see it in the background. You see them recording. Um, and so it it was like it would just be crazy that you know if it, it was crazy how the media just swore they know they knew everything that was going on and and they tried to you know put out this thing that I was changing my shot. I was doing this, that, and the third. And to me, it was always like, wow, I was like crazy. So many people think they know, you know, a narrative or what's going on in a situation, um, but have no clue. And it was like, it was always something new, you know, it was people saying it was so much crazy stuff going on. You know, people saying I got a motorcycle accidents, you know, all types of things. And I would just crack up laughing like, dang, like this is what, you know, what is going on. And, all from somebody, you know, starting something and somebody picking it up. So it was just like I had to almost cleanse myself of, of looking at it because not that it bothered me, like, in, to a point, like, where I look at it, I'm like, oh, man, I hate myself. I, I mean, I suck. I mean, how could people think of this? It was almost like after you start to see stuff so much on the Internet, you, you kind of start to it, – it starts to mess with your mind a little bit. Like, fuck, like, why the fuck are people always, like, thinking they know something? So – um, it just got to the point where I had to like just stop looking at everything on social media and just literally lock into you know myself and, and and what I had going on in the gym because at the end of the day basketball has always been something that's been an outlet for me so it's always been something that you know no matter what my problems are going on off the court uh, anything else can be going on when I step on the floor it's like my sanctuary I'm just happy I have fun and uh, I think that's what you see on the floor when, like like you said when I'm in Orlando you know I just have pure joy and fun playing the game of basketball. So it was really like kind of trying to mess with my mind. It was just like something that continue to know that it's in the back of your head that people are saying this, that, and the third, but you know the truth, Kel. And I'm never the type to, um, again, I was 19. I wasn't the type to, you know, I'm going to go to the media and talk back like, this isn't true. You know, this isn't, this is all bullshit because I, I had a bigger picture in my mind. So it was always just, you know, Kel, just continue to pray, continue to work. Everything else is, you know, going to take care of itself. But um, it's definitely something that, you know, if you don't have the the right mental toughness and the right uh, people around you to have the right mindset, uh, the internet and media can can mess up, you know, can mess you up big time. But that's something that I didn't allow to happen. But it was definitely something that was super tough, you know, never being in that position from my whole career. You know, I was came out of high school, you know, I was always – you know, the underdog and I always had good stuff, you know, said about me. So to, to actually see like all this craziness on the internet about me, it was just like, this, this, this is what the big leagues are about. This is, you know, this is what they talk about when they say, you know, the media can, can change you, but you know, it was, it was crazy. Um, but again, it's something that I learned from it. It made me stronger today. The, the, the emotional toll of that is unavoidable. I, I, yeah, the emotional toll of unavoidable because you're dealing with things on two fronts. So you're dealing with, and, and I'm an athlete, I've had injuries. And so yeah. you, you're dealing with your body failing you to some degree <laughs> and, and then having to reconcile that with the rehab process. Um, and then there's this sort of emotional toll that specific to you came with that injury. Um, throughout that process, the mental side, did you, were there moments of doubt? Were there moments of confidence or, or, or where you, you doubted your confidence? It's like, am I going to be able to do this again? Absolutely. I wouldn't be human if I, if I didn't. I would be lying if I said there weren't moments where I actually sat there and thought, you know, it would be times I would, I, would, I would leave the gym from shooting thousands and thousands and thousands of shots, you know, you know just trying to find my rhythm and, 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 and push through the shoulder, you know, injury and, and and after I got done rehabbing, I'm like, man, I'm going to get this, you know, just being motivated. And I would come home and be like, what if, what if I'm never able to use my arm again? What if I'm, you know, never going to be able to use my right arm again? So it was definitely times where I, I had those thoughts, but it only motivated me because I would say, well, shit, if I can't do that, I'm going to be able to do everything else, you know, to the best of my ability. So it was almost like, I'm going to show you, mother, like, for real, I'm going to show everybody that. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. I'm still going to be a, be able to have an impact when I'm on the floor and, and do something else, you know, because there's plenty of great players who never uh, shot the ball. I didn't I didn't I didn't think that 
because I couldn't shoot and I had a shoulder injury um, that I wasn't a good basketball player. And I think that's where a lot of people um, like we're just thinking like, oh, he can't shoot. He can't play basketball anymore. And, and, and that's where I really had to realize that, OK, Kel, you got, you know, this going on right now, but it's still so much other stuff that you can bring to the game that that you have that, you know, is valuable. So it almost just, you know, working with what you have now until you, you work yourself back into a condition where you can do what you want to do. And that's that's all it was. JJ, this is for for both of you guys. Um, you know, I think one of the things to JJ, the point you just made about uh, your body failing you. You know, I think the thing that makes professional athletes different than other celebrities who get media criticism or whatever it is 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 the injury component and the physical component. And there's no way anybody in the media can actually understand what you're physically going through, no matter how much they know or think they know or whatever it may be. Like when JJ, in your career as well, when did you? because you've dealt with a ton of criticism and scrutiny since day one. And, and there's a sort of a question of like, ignore things on Twitter, ignore things in the press before Twitter existed, and everything like that. But when did you have to figure out like, all right, you know, if, if something is going wrong with me physically, literally there's nothing anybody can say or tell me that is going to change anything until I, until that part of it is fixed. Yeah. That's a, it's a great question. So there's been, there was one season that, was very worrisome to me. So my first year in LA and Markel, you, you you know this, but I didn't get, I was not a full-time starter for my first seven years of my career. You know, I played for Stan in Orlando. I would start sometimes if guys were hurt, but I was not a full-time starter. So I, I, I sign in LA. I'm a full-time starter. I'm playing on a championship level team. I'm on a four-year deal. And I'm like, this is great. This is all I've ever wanted in my career. Like literally, I so happy. And then 13 or 14 games into the season, DeMarcus Cousin pushes me as I jump for an offensive rebound. This is back when I used to be able to touch the rim. And <laughs> um, I fall. I break my wrist. I, I, but the, your pisiform is the smallest bone in your wrist. I, it shattered into three pieces. And I tore my UCL, the ligament. This is my shooting wrist, by the way. And the doctor says to me, like, he wants to take the bone out, perform surgery, take the bone out. It'll save two weeks on the recovery process. And I'm like, hell no, you've never done this to an NBA player before. He told me actually, he goes, I said, who have you done this to? And he goes, I did it to a catcher for the angels. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, no, this is how I make my money, fam. I need this wrist. <laughs> All right. So, so that whole process going through that, I'm thinking, am I going to be able to shoot a basketball the same way? And this is how I make a living is shooting a basketball. Am I going to shoot a basketball the same way? I come back from that injury. I can shoot fine. I think my second game back, I had my career high. Literally 10 games later, my right quad stops working. Literally, my right quad, my VMO stops working. This was a complete failure of my body. It was my back. It was actually a nerve, a disruption at, at L3. I played in 35 games that year because of those two injuries. And in both injuries, I remember having those exact thoughts, Markel. Am I ever going to be able to do this again? I, I couldn't walk upstairs. My quad had shut off completely. I couldn't even walk upstairs. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I can't even run. How am I going to play basketball again? Going through that, um, I think you, number one, you you appreciate mm -hmm. the game even more. And that's what I saw initially from you when you, when you got to Orlando. Um, but number two, you're actually able to block out. I think it at the end of it, you're able to block out everything else and you're able to just get to the the juice and the juice is the joy of playing. And that's really all you're chasing after. It's not about the other stuff that happens with it. Absolutely. I, I can agree to that. I will say that, you know, coming back out after being off injury and, and, and just – even during an injury, you know, being injured, you, you realize how much you love the game and you realize, you know, every moment that you have on the court, you can't take it for granted. You know, not saying that we ever did or that, you know, I, I just think that I never thought about it in that way. Like, you know, you never know when it's going to be your last time being on the court. So that's something that I take into everything. You know, every time I shoot, every time I just go in for treatment or anything, you know, it really gives me a different appreciation just being able to uh, play the game of basketball. So. Markel, I, I, I want to take a step back to, to high school because I, I don't think a, a lot of people realize this. 
you know, you were sort of the consensus number one pick. You ended up going number one. You were a McDonald's All American, so it's not like you were completely overlooked in high school. <laughs> yeah, but you know, from my understanding, I, th- I think you you didn't make your varsity team as a sophomore. You were like mm-hmm. five feet nine. Yeah. Um, you know, this this in your case, this is not something that was like ordained and destined from the jump, yeah. and and you've 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 sort of had to work extremely hard just to get to this point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's the thing that's like, uh, so crazy about it. I feel like, you know, with the injuries that I had in the league, I feel like it's almost like the same story of almost like my high school, like, like almost my whole life type of thing, like coming into my high school in DeMatha, which is, you know, a pretty big high school in the area and all over the world. Um, I played freshman my ninth grade year. Um, and then my 10th grade year, I came in, you know, said, all right, I'm a child for varsity. Uh, I feel like I can make varsity and I end up, you know, not making it, um, which is, uh, it was kind of like, dang, like, I felt like I should make it. And I kind of wanted to transfer schools, but my mom was like, no, you know, anything that, you know, you commit to, you got to stick with it and, and keep going. So I ended up staying at the math and I end up, you know, uh, playing JV that year, end up getting moved up at the end of the year, um, for a couple games, maybe like, uh, four or five games in the playoffs a little bit. I didn't play that much, but got moved up. And then, then, then my junior year coming back, you know, that AAU year and then coming into my junior year, I just, like, hit a growth spread a little bit. And then that's why I really just started dunking a little bit. But uh, just total domination of the game, like my IQ, um, the way I competed, because I just had a different hunger. You know, after being cut, I just said, you know, I'm always going to be the most hardworking and also, you know, with my God gifted ability, you know, take that to higher levels. Um, I came out my junior year and I won the player of the year of my high school, which is people say is one of the toughest high schools uh, conference, which I believe. Uh, and then coming back my senior year and, and doing the same thing, just really, you know, having a great overall game and being able to commit to a college, you know, going into my senior year, you know, the University of Washington, I still wasn't one of the top, high school kids, you know, I started off at like 60. Um, I ended up making it to like 30, you know, uh, uh, 20 my junior year. And then going into my senior year, by the time I left, I was number seven in my class. Um, but I still wasn't on, you know, number one uh, uh, on a draft board going into college. And then right after, like, kind of like I played USA um, for the first time and I played with the uh, U18, U19 team. We had went to Chile. And I won MVP of that. That's where it kind of started to click of this, you know, me being something that can really, you know, take off. And again, I went to college and started to, you know, slowly grind my game out there. We didn't have a great year, but um, I just competed to the highest level and tried to bring my teammates with me. And that's where it really started to click of, you know, uh, of Markel Foles being, you know, that guy, the, the, the number one pick who can help, you know, his team and, and everything like that. And, um, it kind of took off from there, but it was it was it was a grind. It wasn't nothing was ever handed to me. It was something that, you know, I worked for. And as the time went along, you know, it just slowly my hard work started to pay off and I started, you know, to to become, you know, bigger in other people's eyes. And then I became number one pig. And it was just like that was the first time I actually felt like, you know, I was looked at as one of the best players, you know, and because other than that, I was always that guy who, you know, you just end up finding out about when you came to see somebody else and you're like, oh, my God, who's this guy, you know, in the gym. And, 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 and that was the first time I actually had all this, you know, buzz around. And then uh, being injured, it was like the same thing was happening all over again. To me, it felt like being cut from JV. So it was like, you know, people doubting me, people saying, oh, he's a bust, he's this, that, and the third. And, you know, in my head, I was just like, this is the same thing all over again, just grind and, and, and get right and, and get there. Wait, so I, I want to go back to something you just said. So, so – Getting drafted number one was that important to you? Like it, it sounds like that, like like that that was the validation in some ways. I had that goal in high school. In high school, when I was going into my senior year, it's funny because me and Chase Young, who was end up being a, a big pick in, in football, um, this was, I, I had this confidence in myself. Like they will always ask me, you know, who you think you can't guard in your class? We you just used to talk trash, you know. And I told them like. Yo, when it's all said and done, when we're done, I'm going to be the number one pick in the NBA. And so that was always in my mind, like, Kel, that's my goal. Like, I want to be the best player in the draft. And 
it was crazy because I said that. And then as I'm going along, it's actually getting there. It's actually getting close. And I'm like, oh, man, like I'm really about to be the only one picking the draft. And it's just like crazy to set a goal and knock down, you know, the steps to get there and actually become the only one pick. It was just like, there you go, Carol. Now, now you, you know, you everybody can realize what you see, you know. So it was it was just good. It was a blessing. Marco, I don't know if I don't know if everyone in our audience knows this, but Dematha is like consistently one of the best, if not the best, high school basketball team in the country year in and year out. And DC is definitely one of the top two or three areas for high school basketball. Yeah. Were you so like Vic Oladipo went there, Quinn Cook went there? There's been a bunch of recent pros that went there. Yeah. Were you were you on a team with any of those guys, or did you play with any of them in a real way? Uh, I actually didn't play with those guys, but I was always at Dematha camp when I was uh, middle school. Um, because I was so much younger than those guys, but I always was like around when they were around. I used to watch them play, you know, Victor, uh, Jaron, uh, Jeremy, um, like you said, Quinn Cook. They they even had Josh Selby. They had a lot of a lot of pros and, and very good basketball players come through there. Um, but they were just leaving like maybe like I was coming in as a freshman and they had just left. So they were a few years ahead of me, but. Uh, going into the math, you know the history of, of of all the players that you know came before you, and, and like you said, it's it's a it's a powerhouse. So it wasn't like it was like a normal high school I got cut from, but it was like you had to work there. It was like it wasn't no handout. So it was it was a fun experience to be able to be around so many people who were so talented. You know, uh, Kel, uh, Bishop O'Connell, they're in the yeah. they were in your conference. Yeah, they're in our conference. Yep, uh, Gonzaga, right? Gonzaga. Yep, is was Montrose. My, no, Montrose isn't in our our oh, conference. Uh, okay, they're in a, a different DC one. But they used to we used to play against. You know, they used to be in a lot of our tournaments and stuff like that. Yeah, because we we played uh, we played Bishop and and um, and Gonzaga. What my junior year of high school, mm-hmm. actually, we had like a three overtime game against Bishop O'Connell. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend outscored me. It was the only time in his high school career he had more <laughs> points than me. And he talks about that. Ga- Tyler Lumsden. Tyler, I know you listen to the pod. I'm giving you a <laughs> shout out. Tyler <laughs> Lumsden had 36 and I had 30. I was in foul trouble. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, Kel, I also, I want to, I want to, I wanted to ask you about your, your, your movement. Um, because there's a, like the way you move is so unique yeah and i've never really asked you about this but like guarding you is hard you're there's a shiftiness there's an awkwardness to the movement Mm -hmm. is that something that just came naturally or is that something especially with the basketball that you were able to develop it's it's funny you say that uh it was kind of like growing up i used to always like street ball like i was always into street ball hot sauce um all that And so it was kind of a combination of one having big feet and always tripping. I was very clumsy, you know, growing up. So I had to learn how to um, control my body a little bit differently, but also having a little bit of mocking, you know, street ball and and finding a way to get away with it on the court, you know, where I made it like legal. And so it's more so like a unorthodox movement. Like I have, I had, I had to do a lot of basic skill work of just, you know, dribble moves, spins, um, twin legs, everything. And I, I kind of just put my own flair on it because um, I use like my herky jerkiness and just like the way I, my body naturally is, like I'm just clumsy. So, but I found out how to control it a little bit. I still don't have it all the way down, you know, I'm still working on it, but um, it's definitely something that was kind of like natural, but I also like put in a little bit of work with it, like just reps and reps and reps of just doing moves and, and trying stuff, so. I, re- I remember one of your first practices back, your rookie year. And at that time, I'm like, I'm all right, this motherfucker's got to knock a couple of jumpers down <laughs> yeah. before I guard him. And there were like two plays in this one practice where I'm like, I'm just going to meet him in the paint. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you were just by me. Now, I'm not the best defender in the world, but but the shiftiness is real. It's yeah, a real thing. Absolutely. Pe- pe- people don't realize it until, until you see it in person or, or have to guard it, you know, and, and I, I'll just give, you know, I don't know. I just think that it's a, it's a gift from God to be able to, you know, for me to be able to get to where I want to get to, you know, even not having the ability to so-called shoot like people say, or, you know, with the space I'm given on the floor, but um, it's something that I definitely take advantage of, of just, you know, using my shiftiness to, to, to get to where I want to get, especially with my big body. 
That's actually a great way to put it because I, I you, that was that was my observation was this guy can get wherever he wants to go on the court. He can get wherever he wants to go on the court. It's a new year, so leave what you don't need in the past and sell those luxury items at the Real Real. The Real Real is the most trusted source for authenticated luxury consignment, and you can sell everything from women's and men's luxury fashion and accessories to fine jewelry, watches, art, and home decor. It's easy, items sell fast, and you earn more, up to 85% of the selling price. The Real Real has made selling simpler than ever. Choose your own virtual appointment time and meet by video with a luxury manager. They'll walk you through the selling process, give you price estimates for your items, and help you decide what to sell. After your appointment, the Real Real will arrange a free pickup. You can also sell in person, safely, and easily at one of the Real Real's locations across the country or just request a free shipping label to send your items in. Selling your luxury items with The Real Real isn't just smart financially, it's sustainable. Your items will find a new home with one of our millions of luxury shoppers and you earn a return on your investment. It's a win-win. Start selling and earning today. Visit therealreal.com to book your free appointment. I'm gonna, uh, I wanna ask you about Nick Vucevic, one of your teammates, yeah. who, who is oft overlooked. Um, he is off to a blistering start this oh. season. Um, I looked it up today. He's in the top 10, I think, maybe even top five of, of player efficiency rating across the league. He's made an all-star team. His knock early on in his career was that he, he, you know, he couldn't be the anchor of a defense, but with Cliff and Orlando, he's been the anchor of, I think, two or three top 10 defenses. Um, he is He's one of the most underrated players in the league, I think. Absolutely. I would definitely say he's one of the most underrated. And and I think even for our team, like you don't really realize how how efficient and how well he is he's doing on the floor because it's like you just suspect it almost like it, it'll be times in a game like, you know, you're just making the right play to Vooch and the next thing you know, he, he's hitting a float, he's hitting the three, and then you come out to the bench, you look up at the scoreboard and uh Vooch has, you know, 25 and, and 15 rebounds. And you're like, like, when did that happen? Like, it's just so, like, it's just who he is. And and, and he has just a, a terrific, like, feel for the game. You know, he can really pass the ball as a big, and he has great touch. Um, So it's like, it's one of those things that, like, you don't you don't really see it because he isn't, like, one of those loud mouths, like, talking trash type of, you know, people, but he's a killer. And, and even on the defensive end, you know, he's smart enough to make the right plays. He's big enough, you know, to, to be in the right position. He might not be your best shot blocker, but he's able to make it tough where, you know, it ain't going to be easy because he knows the game. So it's like one of those things like I'm very happy to have a, a guy with that amount of IQ and, and skill on the floor with me, you know, to be able to play with him. So I, I played with Vooch um, my last year in Orlando before I got mm -hmm. traded. Um, and didn't know a lot about him because um, mm -hmm. he was coming off a rookie season in Philly. Yeah. where he didn't play a lot, and I certainly am not watching USC basketball. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm like, I, we get this yeah. kid, and at the time his accent was a little stronger. And, uh, you know, so I, we start playing with him, and I'm like, yo, this guy's really good. Yeah. And and then the game start, and he's getting double-doubles. And I just – I had no idea that he was going to be this good. And it it's a credit to his work ethic too because – I, he didn't have an 18 footer when I first started playing with him, much less a three point shot, which he's yeah. shooting the shit out of the ball right now. Yeah. Um, he's, he's just a fantastic player. Cliff, Cliff, by the way, is one of my favorite people and favorite coaches that I've played for in this league. Um, how, how important it's not just the X's and O's to me with him. He's just there. There's a humanity aspect that he just gets. He just gets human beings he knows how to talk to them. He knows how to push buttons because he's a truth. He's a, he's a truth teller. He's definitely Absolutely. a truth teller. Um, <laughs> how how important has he been for you in your development over the last couple of seasons? Uh, he's been huge. He's been one of the biggest pieces of it, if not um, the biggest. Uh, after you know, of course, the medical staff and the GMs, but he's he's just been always been honest with me. And like you said, he has a great way to you know uh, speak to you to get the best out of you, but also he's going to keep it you know, completely honest with you and um, whether you like it or not. And I think that's the best thing for me because that's something that I've always been, you know, brought up on is just, 
you know, give me the real and let me know what I need to do, you know, in order to become a better person and a, a better basketball player. And um, he's just he's just great, man. He, he, he knows what he's talking about basketball wise. But I think the biggest thing is just being able to be comfortable enough to, you know, be able to. Uh, if I have to pick up the phone to call him about anything, I feel like if I have to call him about something going on in life, I, I feel very comfortable doing that. And it's something that he um, made, you know, known um, first day. And I, I don't think it's not only for me. I feel like a lot of the players feel that way. You know, he's really open um, and, and he cares about, you know, everything. You becoming a, a, a great person. Um, and also he he's going to make sure he gets the best out of you on the court too. So, I think that that was a big, you know, part of it, you know, going into Orlando, just having a coach like that who um, just embraced, you know, togetherness and, 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 and freedom and being able to have confrontation. You know, that's his big thing. Like if you're if you don't get in any confrontation, then, you know, it's, you're not having a great year. You're not you're not doing everything right, because it's going to be times where, you know, you disagree and that's where you have to talk about things. So um, he's been extremely great. You know, I, I'm thankful to be able to have him in my life. Marco, my question for you about the team this year is do you feel a little bit like like people sleep on you guys? Um and, and part of why I ask that is like I'm you know, you're five and two. We're taping this on, you know, when we're taping this now, you guys are five and two. Yeah. Uh you have you have talent up and down the roster. I mean, it's not a it's not like it's one or two guys and the rest of the team. It's like it's a very deep team that goes whatever nine, ten deep. And even last year, like when you when in your playoff team, you know this is not a, it's not a team that like won nineteen games last year or anything like that. But yep. yet, no one seems to really talk about uh, you know where you guys are going. So I mean, I, that's my sort of question is like, do you embrace that part of it? <laughs> um, you know, uh, yeah. You know, is there is there is there an element there where you're like being the underdog, especially with where you were, how you started in your career is something that's almost nice in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I think it it just goes with my story and my life, man. It's always being an underdog. And I feel like, you know, a lot of teams don't give us I don't think I wouldn't say teams. I I think the 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 media or whatever you want to call it doesn't have us, you know, being a playoff team this year. Um a lot of the polls have us not, you know, being like 10th or whatever. Whatever. Um but I actually feel like we have a really 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 good team and, and like you said I think it's it's because we have a, a deep team you know you don't know who's going to come out and, and and score especially with the way we play now you know playing so fast and and just moving the ball I feel like that's what makes our team so good because you don't know who's going to kill even any given night it can be you know Evan it can be AG it can be Vooch it can be all of us it can be you know Bacon you know and our bench goes deep so it's like I think that's what's so exciting and then again with Cliff you know being a de- defensive minded coach, uh, seeing what we can do on defense and, and, and knowing that, you know, being, being on the team last year and seeing, I know how coach likes defense and how well we can play and knowing where we are this year, you know, we're nowhere close to it, you know, defensively at how good we can be. Uh, it's exciting. And it's fun because I, I, I just get excited every game that we go out to, to be able to shock the world, you know, just take it a game at a time and, and especially this year, not knowing, you know, what's going to go on, you know, with the second half of the season or anything. Um, I think it's just you really have to lock in on just one game at a time. And I think that we have a great chance to to, to shock a lot of people. So it's, it's going to be fun. We've, we, we often get accused of being a pro Miami Heat um, <laughs> podcast, but I, I really like no, I'm, I'm being serious. I really like your team this year yeah. and I like. I like Cliff as a coach. He's a coach I trust. And I also think there's a benefit specifically for your team with the way this schedule is set up and, and the way that the way that Cliff operates. Like I would not be surprised if you guys, you know, are, are one of the higher seeds in the East. Yeah. Um, Kel, before we let you go, your story is still being written. Are you are you able to appreciate what you've gone through over the past three seasons. Are you able to appreciate it? Like, have, is any part of you ever think to yourself, man, I wish I didn't go through this. And I, you know, I wish I came out of the gates and was averaging 25 a game. And are you, are you able to appreciate this now? Man, I appreciate it so much. Like it's, it's crazy. I, I do. I, I used to have those thoughts like, man, what if I, I came in as hot as I wanted to, you know, I would have came in killing da 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 da. And who knows where I would have been? Who knows if, you know, this injury would have came later, how I would have dealt with it. But 
uh, I think that, you know, where I'm at today is I feel the best that I ever felt, you know, mentally, physically, um, spiritually. Like, I've learned so much, not only about basketball, but being a man, um, the business side of basketball, um, every aspect. And I, and I realized how tough I was, you know, because um, I've never been through anything like that where I have I wasn't able to play the game that I love. So um, I, I look back on it sometimes and, and just think about where I'm at today and where I was, you know, uh, when I first got in the league and, and even my second year and third year, you know, and it's just I appreciate it so much. And I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, I'm thankful for. People always ask me, you know, if I could change anything, would I? And I always say no, because um, I don't think I would be in the position I'm I'm in today, you know, without going through those things. And I feel like I'm in a great position. So um, it's truly a blessing. And I'm, I'm just thankful for it. Yeah. Well, you know that I'm appreciative of you and um, you're um, one of your biggest fans and, and your growth as a, as a human being uh, is really impressive and something that I, I truly appreciate. And I also appreciate the time. Uh, Thank you Tommy so much, and I, man. Tommy and I really appreciate this man. No, anytime, man. Anytime, anytime you need me, man. I'm always, I'm always going to make some time for you, man. You're my guy. Markel, we're going to make you a correspondent. Don't say that. We'll call you every <laughs> month. <laughs> hey man, whatever. All right. Markel Fultz, we appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. <laughs>